This is the hospital incident command system. This is our board. This is where we write down the positions that have been signed during uh, every event. Uh, for today, we're having a partial activation, so we're not going to use the entire one. There will be no medical staff involved in the operations section. However, we did assign an incident commander, public information. We also have a liaison today in a safety. Well, those are critical functions we fill for this incident today. We also assigned logistics today and also there's been a planning and operations, okay? So this is what our incident command board, it's always set up in the executive office during a real incident. And we here's where we make our assignments. Yep. Okay, these are our command vests. When uh, people arrive to the incident command center, we will uh, assign these job action sheets and the command vest for each person that's on our command board, uh, starting with Incident Command. Here we have uh, where we fill out the assignments for everybody. And it's the hospital uh, Incident Command system forms and instructions. We have radios here. We also have the telephone 8579 and 8412 that we use for the Incident Command Center, also known as Hospital Command Center. Today, uh, for this incident today, we are going to don on our vest and we can show you what the incident command center looks like. We have some key positions that we have assigned today. And uh, today, we uh, go over, this is a debriefing. We want to make sure everybody understands what their uh, position is today and what we're going to be doing. Our objectives today is to make sure we provide a safe, secure environment for everybody coming and going, okay? Everybody knows their assignments. Let's make sure that when uh, any safety issues come up, you call Incident Command. Incident Command Center is going to be here the entire time. There's gonna be two of us working here, okay? Um, if there's any questions at this time, we need to throw them out on the table. I wanna talk a little bit about the emergency call tree list. Everybody has access to it. You can find it on your S drive. That is your shares drive. Each department head has a responsibility to update it whenever they get a new employee or an employee leaves. So on it has every branch, starting with administration, then it goes to cardiopulmonary, dialysis, education, the ED department, physical services, health information management, housekeeping and laundry, human resources, infection control, information services, ICU, lab pathology, maintenance, materials, and it goes on into um, med surge, uh, nutrition services, OB, PT, pharmacy, quality, and surgical, and then security. So why do we have this? Uh, the reason why we have this is in the event of a mass casualty incident or any other incident that we require to implement our emergency call tree list, it's at everybody's disposal. They, they can easily access it. They would follow the protocols of calling um, out the people that are requested to come in. And that information will be done by the hospital command system. We would tell them, hey, we need four people from security. Can you call them in? Or we would call in such people as um, nutrition services if it was after hours and hey can you have four or five people come in so that's why we would implement our emergency call tree list and there's a variation depending on the size of the event would depend on how many employees we would initiate off our emergency call tree list let's talk a little bit about our evacuation plan you know we have an internal evacuation and we have an external evacuation you know an internal evacuation can be from something as simple as a broken pipe in the ceiling and we need to move them from one point to another. We talk about internal evacuation. How would we implement that, you know? It'd be an assessment completed by hospital command center would be assemble their team and say, hey look, we've had a flood in this area, we need to move and from one area to another as far as uh, patient care services go. That is one uh, example of why we would do an evacuation. One is lottery from one department only. The other one can be from one wing to another wing. Um, we can also move patients from upstairs to downstairs. We have specific uh, routes. We have responsibilities for nursing, uh, security, maintenance, housekeeping. 
everybody to be involved in the evacuation. We have an alternate evacuation site. That is the Holiday Inn. What you doing? I'm chilling at the Holiday Inn. In case we had to move outside of this building for one reason or another, the Holiday Inn is our alternate care site that we would transfer patients to uh, another location. Why, why would we pick a, a hotel? Um, if you think about it, they have ADA access. They have two beds per room. They also have uh, showers, toilets, of course. Um, they also have nutrition services, linen services. And keep in mind, if we ever do this, it would only be for a short period of time until we deemed our facility uh, ready for occupancy again. Again, it's only a temporary solution for um, an event that uh, our facility became disabled for whatever reason. And, and the evacuation routes are uh, plain and simple. We have identified that uh, we do have two alternate locations. Um, the Holiday Inn is our priority. The secondary would be out of the fairgrounds. Okay, the fairgrounds, if we ever had to go there, that means we'd have to transport all equipment, uh, including beds, supplies, um, IV poles, such stuff like that. And, and we have in our plan uh, specific duties that uh, each department has in the event that we were to go to our other alternate location. I want to talk a little bit about emergency operation plans. We want to start off with uh, understanding how they're created and why they're created. For each plan, there's a specific response and a responsibility for each employee. Um, let's start out with how do we determine uh, what plan and what is our responsibility? Uh, we create a hazardous vulnerability analysis. And that is done uh, every year with the emergency uh, management team. What we review is our hazards and our vulnerabilities for natural occurrence. How about te technology occurrences such as failure with IS? We talk about hazards and vulnerability with human related events. One of our highest ones that we identify is, of course, a uh, mass casualty incident. It rates very high for us. We talk about natural events. Uh, one of them is wildfire. Wildfire rates very high on our HVA. So with that in mind, after we review our hazardous vulnerability analysis, that determines on what type of exercises we should conduct annually. Every department has a responsibility to know where their emergency operation plans is. Every time we have an announcement overhead, you can refer to your plans if you're not sure. You can go right to it. For this case, we're going to go right to our emergency operation plans, which is uh, code orange. We go right to our code orange plan. Um, we can go right through page 1 to page 17 in reference to what a responsibility is. However, most of us already know, but these plans are uh, accessible on the shares drive like we talked about earlier, and also every department has one available, hard copy. Use them for a reference. They're in your area, know where to find them. So the HVA is created and reviewed annually um, based on natural events, technology events, or um, human events uh, will determine any changes deemed necessary. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the first one in our plan. We'll talk about a code of pink. Let's talk about
identify a code peak is our infant abduction, what is the responsibility of staff during the code peak? Well, what we want you to do is respond accordingly to our plan is go to the closest exit. What we want to do is stop anybody from leaving. Um, in the event of a uh, real code peak, we, we want to stop everybody because they're a potential witness. Uh, what are we looking for? We're looking for anybody suspicious that may be carrying something, such as a gym bag or a duffel bag, to say the least. Um, we want to make sure that we understand a code P could be uh, an abduction of a toddler, not just an infant. Uh, when we stop somebody, we would remind them why we're stopping them. If you go to an exit and there's 20 people standing there, um, we should uh, assign somebody to go to the outside. And what are you looking for? Looking for somebody leaving, uh, such as uh, a vehicle uh, speeding away quickly, what we want from them. Of course, if we can get a license plate, that's great. Um, if we can um, get a color in uh, the type of vehicle, such as a pickup truck, a four door sedan color, the way they're leaving, and how do we get that information to security? Well, you should call immediately, extension 300, and relay that message as quickly as possible. Security then will contact Rock Springs Police Department via radio and let them know uh, what we've seen and the area they have left from and what route they're taking. That way it's done very quickly. So in our plan we also say that we're going to uh, make sure that we contact appropriate people uh, as quickly as possible if there is a successful uh, abduction. Here in Wyoming, we know there hasn't been any documented cases from hospitals. However, we do have a plan in place to follow. Basically, go to the exits, stop anybody from leaving the department, um, make sure you let them know why. Never put yourself in harm's way. Um, if in fact, if somebody is leaving and they, and they power their way through you, that's fine. Make sure that you get a complete description and that the information of that individual leaving the facility gets to security as quickly as possible. We'll make every effort to uh, make the recovery happen as quickly as possible and safely as possible. That's what we do in a Code Pink. Let's talk a little bit about our uh, Code Orange plan. What is that? That is our Mass Casualty Incident Plan. Everybody needs to understand that. Uh, anytime we would activate a Code Orange, we would set up a hospital command center. Uh, we would have a command team uh, come up. We would um, implement our emergency call tree list based on the information received um, on the incident. So would we do a partial activation? We have three levels of response. We have a code orange standby. What is that, a code orange standby? Code orange standby. The last time we went into a code orange standby is when we had a uh, plane do an emergency landing right here, and they were 20 minutes out. What we done at that time was we implemented a partial uh, emergency call tree list, uh, mostly with the uh, patient caregivers, starting with the emergency department. Um, within 20 minutes, the plane was on the ground. Uh, they landed safely. They evacuated the plane. Uh, they did contact the hospital and let us know that everything was okay. But that's just an example of why we would go into a code orange standby. The other one would be, we have a code orange minor, which is, you know, we receive information about an incident, and I'll give you another example. Out on the interstate, we had a pile up. We were receiving erroneous reports about uh, 20 victims, 30 victims, 50 cars piled up. Um, when it was all said and done, um, we only had about 10 victims um, that were involved in the pile that needed medical attention. So we implemented a partial uh, part of our emergency call tree list. We called in the appropriate amount of people for the size of the incident. Okay, so when we had some latitude, before we used to call in a disaster, we would call everybody in, despite the size of the incident. Now we have the ability, flexibility, to call in the appropriate amount of staff for the size of the incident. Okay, and that gets back to implementing an emergency call tree. So what happens if we go into a code orange major? Hey, we're going to call in everybody. The general instructions for all employees is that you come to the hospital, you report to your department, 
the department will inventory everybody that has been received and they will call into the hospital command center and let them know how many people they have and what their expertise, such as if maintenance calls in, they're going to say, hey, we got three maintenance mechanics here. How can we use them? We'll tell them, hey, stand by. We'll call you when we need them. Such as uh, if the lab comes in, they're going to call in and say, hey, we just had three lab people come in. We're going to say, okay, two of you need to go to the emergency department and meet with um, operations officer that we assigned. And they will delegate what they need to do. Okay, so it's important that you know you report to your department. The department head there or the leader in that area will report to the hospital command center how many people we have. What we don't want to do, we want to avoid everybody just showing up in the emergency department. We want you to come when you're called upon. Hospital command will take inventory of all the staff that have arrived, and then we will delegate responsibility as we see necessary. Okay, so we have identified a couple of areas that um, we think is best to set up a hospital command center. We know the executive offices would be a primary location during business hours. However, after hours, we know the ED department has. The whole bronze area, the bronze pod area. This is the emergency room uh, bronze pod that we talked about that we could possibly use for a hospital a command center. If you look right here, there's several rooms that go down there. You've the bathroom down there, but also there's uh, showers here. So let's, it's got some nice features down here. If you look around right here, we also have a tube system that we can receive drugs from downstairs and event blood and ear samples can go out to the lab. Uh, what's really critical here is that we have um, good communication systems. We have three laptops or uh, tabletops here. We also have three phones, landlines, plenty of room. We like the idea that we have a, the board here for patient information. And also what's nice, follow me this way. This is the emergency department of clean supply and equipment storage. So we have a lot of the stuff that we would use uh, if we were to activate our hospital command system. So, here's the board. Showed that to you guys earlier. Uh, we store that down here. If you look in here, we got the ER disaster kit and clipboards. Um, we have an additional uh, box of hospital command vests. This is an event that we ever had to go to uh, an alternate location such as the Holiday Inn. We can also um, put, put vest on uh, the command members down there. If you look at here, uh, we've got some radio, radiation disaster kit supplies right here. Um, if you look right down here, uh, some more disaster kit supplies, hazardous apparel kit, um, some of your basic stuff uh, that you would use and take out to the ED core once we've got things going. And if you look right here, here is the hospital instant command vest kit. All the vests are in here, the additional supplies. This right here, this goes to uh, physical therapy. This is for the walking wounded. Um, it's full of uh, uh, supplies for uh, dealing with minor injuries. So we encourage everybody when they come in that they come through the staff entry, okay? There may be somebody there challenging you if you do not have your ID, okay? They may ask where you work, uh, who's your supervisor, such things like that in order to allow you to come into the hospital. So that's one of the things that we identify. We also identified, if it was after hours on a weekend at two o'clock in the morning, and we call you up and say, I can't come in right now because I have nobody to watch my children. We now will um, set up a childcare area if we have to. It may be down here in the basement. It also may be in an off-campus location. However, it probably, probably would start here at the hospital. And we would use other people, such as the business office people, or maybe uh, some of the housekeeping people, to set up a child care down in the basement. That way, the people that are, that are mostly needed, they can arrive. We do have child care forms. You would fill it out, say who you are, who your child children are, um, and we would set up a, a child care area somewhere located in the hospital, primarily the basement, and maybe the cafeteria as well. Okay. 
So we also had to do something different this year. We had to add elder care as well. If you're responsible for taking care of your, uh, maybe your grandpa or your grandmother, um, and you have to leave to the hospital and you, you don't want to leave them behind, we have a place here and a plan to take care of them as well. Uh, so that was a great concern of ours too. We know from all the other disasters that other hospitals experienced, a lot of staff did not want to come in because they had to take care of either their children, or their elders, or their loved ones. And so we identified that we need to have a plan in place. If they need to bring them up here, we have a place to care for them. So that's included in our plan. Okay. So we talk about um, how we can uh, accommodate um, your loved ones if needed, um, and how we would do that. Um, we talked about um, how we would implement an emergency call tree list. Either we go to a standby, or we go to a code orange minor, code orange major. Um, once you come to the facility, you be, de be delegated with certain responsibilities. We may implement our hospital incident command system. You'll see people wearing vests. These are the command staff. They will be uh, delegating responsibilities uh, and duties to uh, certain individuals under their command. So um, the command staff is located in the hospital command center. They won't be there all the time. Um, they'll be out there with the frontline staff as well. We'll always identify an incident commander, somebody that who's going to uh, be at the top of the, of the order of the command staff. Um, and there'll be uh, individuals that will be working under his um, command. Um, I don't want to go into too many details about this. You just need to understand that a hospital command system exists and we would implement it in the event of a mass casualty incident. Not more than likely if we have a minor incident, not likely that we would implement the hospital incident command system. Of course, in a big event, whether it be a, uh, a hazardous incident or a natural occurrence, we would probably uh, implement the hospital incident command system. Everybody would be wearing vests that are belonging to the hospital command staff. Um, and that's the difference between a minor and a major. Major means we will implement the hospital incident command system, a minor not likely, but we will identify command staff. Okay, I'm laying on the charge, nice and sweet. Good to go. I'm coming back. Five meters out. Five. Twenty-five. Twenty-five meters, Roger. <laughs> plan right now. Everybody needs to understand how it starts, how it initiates, and what, what the responsibilities of each employee. Once we uh, confirm that, in fact, we did receive a code black bomb threat, we'll immediately announce overhead uh, that code black has been initiated. And what does that mean to us? That means that everybody has the responsibility to search their immediate area. We don't expect the police officers to come in here and be familiar with your area, so make sure that when you conduct your search that you do it in a systematic manner uh, from the floor up to the waist level, from the waist level up to the ceiling. Uh, we'll generally, uh, first thing we'll do is uh, search the immediate area of the executive offices where we can set up a hospital command center. Once that has been completed, the next step will be we'll break out the code black box. The code uh, black box contains uh, additional keys. We also have pads in here. We have plans of the hospital. Um, we have master keys. We also have uh, signage. No public access. Please use emergency room entrance. Um, that is just a diversion. We may never even implement that. We may just go into a whole lockdown mode, not allow anybody to come in the facility, but we do have some signage in the event that we do have um, a need to have people come in still to go on with normal uh, care as much as possible. So we do have this. It's located in the uh, 
hospital command center, which is uh, primarily used as the executive offices. And this is all the materials that we would have in there. There's pins, there's tapes, there's colored markers, there's master keys in here. So uh, in the event that uh, we need to distribute uh, keys out to people to go to key locations, we'd also give them a card access as well. The plan is very simple. There's three pages that initiates responsibilities uh, about hospital security, what their responsibility is, the PBX operator, what they're supposed to do, maintenance and ho housekeeping, and uh, all other employees. It talks basically about the general procedures, about searching, and uh, about the hospital command, uh, how it's utilized, and then it also talks about the recovery process and uh, what to do in the event if you did find one. It talks about you, you must evacuate immediately. Hospital Command Center will um, determine the area and location that you will evacuate. And then when it's over, code black will be announced overhead. Code black all clear, code black all clear. You'll hear it three times. This is a map of the second floor med surge. This is our map, key plan. This shows the main entrance coming in, business office and all of the ED, medical imaging, um, operations, um, same day, OB, and the new area in the OB as well. So what we do is once we've searched all the areas, we check them all off, and we, won't, we will not call them all clear until the complete area inside and out has been searched. Let's talk a little bit about um, our severe weather. A monster tornado slammed into Joplin. One of the most shocking images was the destruction of St. John's Mercy Hospital. Mike, are you all right? You're seeing some just terrible things, I'm sure. And I know you were there just moments after the tornado hit. This is going to be really tough for you. Um, you know, just looking at it from here is bad enough. But to be there and actually witness this devastation, it's just incredible. Yeah, and Mike, I can imagine yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you, you come out here and you're trying to find research, trying to find, you know, what could and could, can't cause storms, and then you, you come across this. This has got to take your breath away, buddy. It's tough. No question about that. More than 100 patients were inside the nine-story hospital. Gurneys, wheelchairs tossed hundreds of yards away. X-rays, medical records dumped two counties away, 60 miles carried by the tornado. And inside the hospital, there was triage. There was rushing to help. In the aftermath, the entire hospital evacuated in just 90 minutes, medical personnel loading patients up on the backs of pickup trucks and rushing them to a nearby hospital or another triage center. Some held the IV poles for the patients while seeing all around them a scene from Armageddon. It truly was like a bomb went off inside almost on every floor. When they released these photos of the inside, everyone knew they could no longer rely on the one building they needed most. It was obvious that, that this facility was incapacitated. Rod Pace ran the medical helicopter program. This is what was left of it. We talk about severe weather, we talk about a tornado watch and a tornado warning. A uh, tornado watch means we're, we're conducive to have a tornado develop. Um, if we get a phone call from the sheriff's office, then they would notify all public offices. And what it would be was an announcement that would come over uh, the PBX operator, more likely would see it unless it was after hours. But not likely. Um, the announcement would be that we're now under tornado watch. Tornado watch means again that we're conducive for a tornado to develop. So the operator would announce overhead, tornado watch is in effect in Sweetwater County. All personnel report to your location. Um, at that point, what we're gonna do is monitor TVs. Hospital security has NOAA on their radio. We would switch to channel 10. East Creek, Water County. The highway warning remains in effect until 11 p.m. Mountain Standard Time this evening. So we would listen to this and monitor that. And if it goes to the next level, which is a tornado warning, we would make sure that uh, we go to the PBX operator, let her know right away to make the next announcement. That is a tornado warning. Okay, now when we go to a tornado warning, the announcement we're going to hear overhead is going to be 
Attention all personnel. Tornado warning has been issued. All personnel began patient movement. What does that mean for us? Staff who feel that they can render assistance should go to the patient care areas as quickly as possible and assist with patient movement. Either they're coming to the basement or they're gonna go into the core areas of the hospital. But that's what we do when we go to the tornado warning. Baltimore's prestigious Johns Hopkins Hospital was the scene of violence on September 16, 2010, when a gunman burst into one of the hospital's buildings and opened fire, shooting at least one doctor. According to ABC News, the doctor was shot in the abdomen and taken to surgery. Baltimore police said the doctor's injuries are not critical. Within hours after the first report came in about the shooting, Baltimore authorities said the gunman had been shot and killed by police. The gunman, whose name wasn't immediately available, was described described as a black male in his 30s. There was no official word from police on what prompted the man to start shooting inside the Johns Hopkins building, identified by the Baltimore Sun as the Nelson Building, which houses a thoracic center. The newspaper quoted a nurse inside the building when the suspect began shooting as saying the shooter was upset about the medical treatment of his mother. He was threatening to jump out of a window. The Baltimore Sun reported that after opening fire on the eighth floor of the hospital building, the unidentified gunman barricaded himself in a room there. Reports said several Johns Hopkins employees were evacuated and the entire hospital was put on lockdown. Those workers who were not evacuated were reportedly told via email to stay in rooms at the hospital. All right, let's talk about our Code Silver plan. Um, everybody knows that violence in America is on the rise and there's a lot of copycats out there doing the same kind of horrific crimes. Um, so we had to create a plan for a gunman or a person coming in with a weapon intent to come in here and cause bodily harm. Unfortunately, um, it happens and so we have a plan created, it's called Code Silver. Uh, the purpose of this plan is to know what to do in the event that we announce a Code Silver overhead and know what your responsibility is. It's basic, you know, you hear a Code Silver, you should react quickly know where a safe haven is in your location of your uh, department or if you're in and out and about and we got key access you know um, a lot of areas uh, throughout the hospital has badge access you know you, you want to bail into a place as quickly as possible if a code silver is announced you know basically we're just telling you find a safe haven do not leave that area until you hear overhead code silver all clear Keep in mind, um, when, you, when you go into your uh, safe haven area that you're going to turn your phone down and make sure that uh, no distractions that would uh, bring the attention to the person that's going uh, through a f facility uh, creating these crimes. Make sure that you understand that um, we don't leave until we absolutely are definitely sure that the event is over. All right, this is what it should look like. We have a code silver. You know, keep in mind, we're going to harbor ourselves in a safe location. Here's an area that we identify that would be safe. Um, you're going to get your badge access. Come in here. I'm going to go to this room. I'm going to close the door. Lights are out. This is a good, safe location. This is what we're talking about, harboring yourself in a safe location. All right, so understanding uh, Code Silver basically is to harbor yourself in a safe location, uh, find a locked door, uh, turn out the lights, turn off your phone, uh, be vigilant of what's going on around your environment as much as possible, uh, make sure you don't open the door for somebody who is knocking that you can't identify. It's best that you don't open the door at all. However, if it is somebody's voice you are familiar with, it would be fine to open that door and close it as quickly as possible. Okay. It was an ordinary school board meeting until Clay Duke took the floor. I have a motion. He spray paints a red V on the wall and clears out the room. To everybody in this room, behind that counter, hit the road. 56-year-old Duke claims to be upset because the board fired his wife. He pulls out a gun. The women and children scramble as news cameras inside capture the chaos. 
In a heroic attempt to stop Duke, school board member Ginger Littleton actually comes back into the room and whacks Duke defiantly with her purse. <laughs> School board superintendent Bill Husfeld tries to convince the gunman to let the others go. Will you let them go? I mean, but you're obviously upset at me. So why are they here? They're part of it. Part of what? The scam. Sir, I, I don't know what you ran. The two men argue. Husfeld, with steel in his voice, has the presence of mind to try and calm the armed, agitated man. I don't want anybody to get hurt, and I, I've got a feeling that what you want is the cops to come in and kill you because you're you're mad because you said you're going to die today. But why? If this is this isn't worth it, this is a problem. Please don't. Please don't. Please. At this point, Duke fires the weapon, but remember, he misses, and no one is hurt. <laughs> I'm going to He misses every time. Security guard Mike Jones fires at Duke off screen. We will not show you the final moments as Duke fatally shoots himself in the head. Let's talk a little bit about our, our, our Code 7 plan, okay? Uh, it, it mirrors our uh, Code Silver plan. It's, it's the same reaction. The Code 7 is that there's a hostage incident that has taken place in our hospital. The difference is when we talk about a code seven is that we talk about what happens if you happen to be involved somehow in the hostage situation plan. Um, we talk about, we try to tell you to remain calm, be a good listener. If they are demanding drugs or money, provide it to them as quickly as possible. We want to tell you, avoid any unnecessary conversation. Be polite, uh, try not to show any weakness. Make sure you're aware of your environment, because if there's a hostage situation going on, there's going to be an assault team coming as quickly as possible. And more likely, they're going to be wearing their black suits, and they're going to be carrying long rifles. Um, and, and when they come in, there, there's no negotiating, really, to the extent you just need to understand that. Uh, if, if you're looking around, and you're in a room, and you see um, an officer dressed in black, don't give up their... Uh, location. Don't wave to them. Uh, they may do something similar to this, just letting you know they see you. And if they do this, what does that mean to you? It means to get down. Uh, something is going to happen real soon. Um, so keep that in mind. Again, code seven mirrors or code silver. You want to harbor yourself into a safe location. Don't leave that location till you hear the code seven all clear. Sometimes these can uh, last a little bit longer than uh, we normally would think. Um, so we have to exercise some patience. Um, everybody has a responsibility to harbor themselves in a safe location. We talk about getting the patients as quickly as possible as well into a safe location. Um, do that as long as you can. Do not compromise your safety to save another. It's important to know that um, we realize you want to get the patient to a safe location as quickly as possible. However, if you see the incident develop in front of you, harbor yourself in a safe location, okay? That's what we ask of you. We've got breaking news into the KXY4 HD newsroom. The emergency room is shut down at Holy Family Hospital in North Spokane right now. KXY4's Kylie Cruz is live there with the very latest. Kylie. Mike and Nadine, fire crews have been on the scene here for a little over an hour. Now, it all started at about 5.15 this evening when uh, fire crews got a call about a reported chemical substance being dispersed in the south entryway here at Providence Holy Family Hospital in North Spokane. Now, they have, like you just mentioned, shut down the emergency room. We want to let people know to people going into the emergency room, they have shut that down so and diverted them to other hospitals, so be prepared for that. The HAZMAT team is on the scene along with about 35 to 40 firefighters trying to figure out what exactly is going on, picking up the substance and trying to figure out the source of what's happening. We do want to let you know, though, nobody has been evacuated and patients have not been moved from the hospital as of now. They are, though, evaluating six people with respiratory problems here on the scene, so it looks like... I'd like to talk about the Code Gray plan. It doesn't affect the entire hospital. Code Gray is anytime we have a um, incident that involves either biological, um, chemical, it's 
such as a hazardous substance uh, where people have been exposed to them, maybe even radiation, that we would uh, implement our emergency call tree, we have a decon team. We have people that have been certified on decontamination procedures. These people are the, the frontliners that will be involved in the code gray. Um, they have the responsibility to um, don on uh, our pappers. Uh, it's a breathing apparatus that uh, they would put on. Uh, they would also don on a special uh, uh, PPE uh, from head to toe. They would go through the decon procedures that they've been trained to do. Everybody needs to understand we have a decon room in the emergency department. It's a dedicated room uh, with air and water. There's a bladder that would catch all the water material um, and it goes out to uh, a location outside of the uh, room. Uh, that room also has a dedicated entrance. So we would receive them from the outside going right into that room that way we avoid any contamination in the emergency department. So we identify that there's a one room uh, leading from the outside. It has a shower. It also has all of our uh, PPAE equipment in there. Uh, so we would don on our uh, equipment prior to the arrival, hopefully. If not, uh, we would um, take the time to put on our equipment as quickly as possible and then provide the decontamination process as quickly as possible. So Code Gray has a minor impact on the entire hospital. It's mostly um, designed uh, for the decon team uh, and going through the decon procedures. Basically, that's what Code Gray is. Okay. Decontamination room, ED-17. And this is the decon room. Here's the uh, dedicated entrance we talked about. Uh, it goes right to the exterior. Uh, we would receive patients coming in from right here. Okay. They would come into this room. We have a uh, sink here with, with a, sh a shower if we needed to rinse their eyes out. Um, Here's the other shower we're talking about, the main shower. We would uh, put the patient in here. There's the drain we talked about. It has, uh, it goes right out to the bladder outside that's 1,500 gallons. We talked about uh, putting on the decon suits. Each one of them are labeled the size of them. Uh, I'll open one and we'll go over it real quick, what's inside of them. Hazmat suit. This is uh, the power supply the, for the breathing apparatus. Breathe easy, it says here. The papper goes on with that right here. Here's the filters. If you notice, they are still have not been broken into yet, so they're fresh, ready to go. Okay. If you look up here. This is where we keep all the batteries charged all the time. So when we go to put on these breathing apparatuses, the battery's gonna have full strength. We have extra things here, such as cam tape. That's for wrapping up around the sleeves. We have extra gloves. These are really heavy duty gloves designed to manage hazmat materials. Um, we identify we got extra uh, protective suits right here. Um, what about boots? Extra boots that go over your shoes. We identify their sizes on them, extra large right here. And if you notice, we have everything in here for um, taking care of people that could be uh, ill as well. And we still utilize this room for patient care when it's not in use. But it does have a dedicated air system as well to it. Natural illumination, it really helps during the daytime if you have people in here. So this is our uh, econ room. If you notice, it's got cameras. It's got one there. It also got one right up here. So we have a monitor 
out there so we can monitor people in here when they're going through the decom process and the physician can actually uh, talk to them and tell them what they need to do. In this bay, in this bay we have uh, dedicated drains and also would go to our um, decon tank out there with hazardous material. If we needed to do a mass decontamination, we have the ability to do that. This drain right here has a valve. You can turn the valve that goes into the drainage system that goes to the bladder. This is what we have out here too. Inside here is hoses and we can regulate the temperature if we had to put people out here. What we would do is we would put this, we have a, it's called a, they call them pigs actually. They would, we would put the, set it up around here so all the water is captured right here. We'd have the um, victims stand over the drain and we would bring out the hose and wash them over right over this drain and this drain would, uh, be dedicated to go out to the bladder and so if we had to do a massive decontamination we have two of these one here and one right up front too okay we this garage is well heated uh, so in the event in the winter time if we had to bring in people here we could house you know probably a hundred people or more in here if we had to uh, for the decontamination process we also have another door right here that we would allow them to come in through that door right there or this other door right here as well. You hold until I get back, please. Now, anything you want to say to me, I don't have enough of you. No, I don't have enough of you. You no, know I've been, what? I've been very... I don't give a... Oh, Lord Jesus, do not start. I, okay, I ain't the one. Leave me the alone. Uh-oh. Come on. Damn. You don't scare me. What you gonna do? Code yellow. What is it? Code yellow. That is a uh, physical altercation. What we want for everybody to understand is that if there is a code yellow, if you feel like you're physically capable to render assistance, we want you to show up and, and provide help. However, in the event. If you are a witness to a um, persons that are demonstrating aggression and possibly leading to a physical altercation, when do we call and who do we call? What you want to do is make sure that you call extension 300 as quickly as possible and announce that. You please announce a code yellow and be specific to the location as is the room or the department. Okay. Because when we hear a code yellow, it means that we're at a heightened level of security response. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we provide a safe environment as quickly as possible. We want to contain the subject as quickly as impossible, separate the two as quickly as possible. Understand that um, we don't expect everybody to respond to a code yellow. We want the people to respond to a code yellow who feel they're physically capable of rendering assistance. And that's basically it for a go um, The emergency operation plans, you know, we have some general guidelines. Everybody has a responsibility to know what their role is. We can't be one of them hospitals that uh, say this will never happen to us. Let's be prepared. We must have the ability to improvise for each plan. We have some general guidelines, like I said, but we do not um, have specific plans for everything possible that could happen. Uh, myself and the emergency management team uh, appreciates your um, patience and viewing this tape. Uh, it's something new. Uh, we hope you like it. Thank you.